I'd like you to welcome you to the AMATIC 2016 webinar series. Today's webinar is Common Vision 2025 with Linda Brady. This presentation is sponsored by AMATIC and MAA. Oops, I think I hit the wrong button there. Sorry about that. Um, the sponsored committees from AMATIC are all of them. The Developmental Mathematics, Innovative Teaching and Learning, Mathematics and its Application for Careers, Statistics, Mathematic Intensive College Mathematics, Placement Assessment, Teacher Preparation and Research in Mathematics Education for two-year colleges. So basically, it's everybody. The um, American Mathematical Association of Tier College is one of our core values um, regarding professional development, and it is building expertise and exhibiting leadership in the teaching and learning of mathematics, enhancing personal growth, which we're all doing today, and improving teaching methods and effectiveness as a um, personally initiated lifelong responsibility. For more information, please see amatic.org. Please know that the views expressed by the presenter are not necessarily the views of AMATIC. Commercial products mentioned by the presenters are not endorsed by AMATIC. The uh, webinar today is our sponsor is WebAssign. And I'd like to uh, share uh, Linda's biography. Linda Brady is the Vice President for Academic Affairs at Tarrant County College, or TCC, the Northeast Campus. She previously served as Deputy Executive, Executive Director of the Mathematical Association of America, or MM. MAA in Washington, D.C. from 2012 to 2016, where she oversaw MAA programs, public policy efforts, the competitions department, and the meetings and facilities department. While at MAA, she increased the externally funded programs portfolio from $8 million to $14.5 million. She served as Dean of Division of Health and Natural Sciences at TCC South Campus from 2009 to 2011, during which time she assisted with the transition of the nursing program to the Tr Trinity River Campus and subsequently served as Dean of the Division of Mathematics and Natural Sciences on the South Campus from 2011 to 2012. Immediately prior to her tenure at TCC, she was the chair of the Department of Mathematics at East Central University, or ECU, in Ada, Oklahoma, as well as a tenured full professor. Throughout her tenure at ECU, she directed professional development programs for K-12 mathematics, teachers, and other grant-funded initiatives to improve the teaching and learning of mathematics, directed initiatives, redesigned course programs, and won multiple teaching awards at the local and regional levels. She received her PhD in mathematics from the University of Oklahoma, and her research area is is an undergraduate mathematics education. I am so pleased to um, have introduced you to uh, Linda Brady today. Okay, so it's time for me to share yep. my screen. Yep, so I switched over. <laughs> okay, um, here we go. There we go. All right, so um, I really appreciate you all joining us. Um, as Julie said, it's holiday weekend, and so it's great to have people here. Um, hopefully, as she said, we will um, have better success with the technology this time. Um, so I just want to tell you about um, a project that the MAA um, undertook about two, two, two and a half years ago um, called the Common Vision for Undergraduate Math Sciences Programs in 2025. Um, we... Um, MAA and AMATIC and other professional associations are always um, concerned and sort of keep up with what the challenges are that are facing our community, the mathematical sciences community. So um, we all know that math and statistics courses are gateways to many majors, but also they're crucial just for the general education um, component for students um, of all majors. Um, yet, only about 50%, oh, Julie, we forgot about the, <laughs> I forgot about the, um, um, questions. Do we want to go ahead and run those? Is that, am I supposed to do that? Oops, no, sorry. I started it and people are starting to vote, it looks like. Oh, I didn't see that. Sorry I'm sorry. That. No, it's okay. Um, it was going one. too smoothly. I forgot about the polls as well. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just about everyone has voted. Okay. Let's see, give them a few more seconds to actually uh, put their answers in, and then I'll share it. Okay. All right. So I should be sharing it now. Okay, you are. That's okay. great. So the most popular answer was 50% on that one. So um, the next one is, yeah. How much more likely are women than men to choose not to continue beyond Calc 1, even when Calc 2 is required for their intended majors? Uh, 
All right, it looks like everybody voted. Okay, so the most popular answer, a little over half said twice as likely. The next question, I think it has to do with, yeah, in 2012, what percent of all bachelor's degrees were awarded to underrepresented minority students? All right. Okay, so the most popular answer was 20%. Okay. And then the next one is what percent of uh, uh, math degrees, math bachelor's degrees, were awarded to underrepresented minority students? Okay. Okay, so the most popular answer on that was 12%. So you guys pretty much nailed all those. Um, okay, so um, I already showed you part of this. Um, so about 50% of students um, earn a grade of A, B, or C in college algebra courses. So obviously, almost 50% of students get a D or an F or they would draw. Um, and I want to make a note that the references um, for all of these statistics and stuff um, are in the Common Vision Report, which I'll give you a link to that um, later on another slide. Um, you were correct that women are almost twice as likely as men to choose not to continue beyond Calc 1, even when Calc 2 is required for their intended majors. Um, there's a research study um, that the MAA has had going on for about six years that showed, um, that showed this data. Um, and then in 2012, about 20% of all bachelor's degrees were awarded to underrepresented minority students. So about 10% to blacks and about 10% to Hispanics. But only about 12% of math bachelor's degrees were awarded to underrepresented minority students. So you can see it's, it's about half for black students and it's um, just a little over half for Hispanics as far as the math. Um, degrees and failure rates under traditional lecture are 55% higher than for more active approaches to instruction. So when we say more active uh, approaches to instruction here, we mean basically anything that's not traditional lecture, anything that um, engages the students on any level. Um, so that's um, sort of doing anything other than traditional lecture, you get higher um, success rates. So. Um, the impetus for us sort of to launch this Common Vision project um, and to, to try to work on um, a more concerted effort to change sort of across the whole entire math community was that there were two reports that came out that particularly criticized the way we teach math to undergraduates. Um, one of them was from the President's Council of Advisors of Science and Technology in 2012. Um, they basically said that um, physicists and engineers should be teaching calculus because we do such a bad job um, teaching it. And then the mathematical sciences in 2025 um, also criticized um, the way we teach undergraduates. And so that really got the sort of the, the community's attention more as a whole. So the NSF funded this Common Vision project in 2014. Um, the goal was to, to develop a shared vision of how we need to modernize undergraduate math programs, especially in the first two years. So, um, and also to catalyze grassroots efforts to address the challenges that we face. Um, when we say program, um, we're talking about basically anything that goes on in a math department, really. I mean, it's curricula, it's courses, topics, electives, instructional methodology, support structures, tutoring facilities, whatever you have, and extracurricular opportunities, math club, um, undergraduate research, whatever it is. So we're really being all-encompassing when we say program. Um, and when we talk about modern pro modernizing programs, we're talking about programs that reflect the changing face of our discipline, especially in terms of data science, modeling, and computation, that we just don't um, include enough of that sort of thing. Um, and programs that will increase, 
uh, reflect the increasingly cross-disciplinary nature of the STEM fields um, and also provide a coherent introduction to college math for all students, not just for STEM majors. Um, so the Common Vision Project involved representatives from um, the five professional associations who focus on undergrad math science programs as an integral part of their mission. Um, so AMATIC, AMS, ASA, the Statistical Association, then MAA, and then the Industrial Applied Mathematics Society, um, SIAM. And so um, these were the five um, professional associations that are part of the Conference Board on the Mathematical Sciences, um, which is all professional associations that focus on math at any level. So these were the ones that focus on undergraduate math education to some degree. So the, the project leadership team, the people I thought you all would probably know, Rob Farinelli, um, is a past president of AMATIC, and then Uri Treisman um, and the Dana Center, they, um, you know, have done a lot of pioneering work um, in the pathways, the math pathways, and um, they've worked some with um, the Carnegie Corporation on Statway and Quantway and that sort of thing. So he, um, he does a lot of work with developmental math. Um, so we envisioned the Common Vision Project as phase one of a two-part initiative. Um, the first phase, which we are have concluded, um, was intended to be introspective and to try to articulate an internally coherent vision within the community. Part of that was brought on by the criticism from those reports I mentioned earlier. Um, part of the issue we felt was that we were really all saying the same thing, but we were sort of saying it separately, and we felt like if we could sort of present more of a united front and, and have something that all the societies would sort of um, sign on to, um, uh, then that would be more powerful and a better way to communicate what we, um, what we believe and how we're approaching these challenges. So phase two was pro proposed as outward looking and focused on these grassroots efforts and building on existing work and disseminating and implementing modernized curricula and de delivery methods as well as widespread large-scale change. So there are a lot of pockets of really great things going on, but for some reason, uh, not a lot of that stuff tends to, to scale up. We don't, we don't tend to, um, we haven't really figured out how to sort of spread it more widely. And I know we have these issues where we say, well, their students aren't like our students, but you know, there are some, I think there are some core principles that, that would be applicable in a lot of different settings. So we just haven't figured out a way to do that. Um, so we spent the first six months of the project drafting a report of the common themes that we found in existing curricular guides that were published by these five associations. There were other reports that influenced the writing and informed our writing and all of that, but we really were focusing on current um, curricular recommendations and we were not um, seeking to create new recommendations. We were just trying to coherently communicate what everybody's already saying. And so the, uh, three of the reports, there was the uh, AMATIX Beyond Crossroads, which was an update of, of Crossroads back from 1995. And then we had two reports from the ASA on statistics, um, and then two reports from the MAA, and then two reports from SIAM that all had curricular recommendations of some sort. So um, we had a workshop then in May, um, a year ago in May, and we had 50, about 50 people there from higher ed institutions and professional associations, all five of those were represented, um, and business industry and government. And they provided feedback on this draft of this report that we had sent to them ahead of time. Um, and they also drafted proposals for specific initiatives to improve curricula instruction. So um, those are also included in the report. Um, and so that's online and you can also, um, I'll give you the link for it later. So um, some of the accomplishments, we did do some policy work, um, and there's information on the Common Vision website that you can see the policy work that we did, but the major accomplishment was this report. So here's the link, and you'll have these slides. They'll be posted, and so you can get it um, directly from the slides. And we still have, um, I think, a couple hundred copies of the report if you want one, if you want a hard copy or multiple hard copies. If you'll just email me, we can mail them to you. Um, so the report is a synthesis of the common themes 
based on our research and then input from the project participants and then other leaders in the community. We sent the report to other people to get feedback as well. Um, and we summarized four broad areas that we feel, feel like need attention and action from the community. And these were areas that were pointed out in all of these guides. And so they could have been named, organized differently, named something else, but we had to, we had to choose a way to organize it. So here's what we came up with. We came up with curricula, course structure, workforce preparation, and faculty development. <clears throat> And so we hope that the report serves as a foundation for future work. And actually, there, there are some things already that are building on the report, which is great. Um, and we hope it will also so serve as a guide for funding agencies like the National Science Foundation and other funding agencies um, to sort of um, help them target their federal investments that are likely to have sort of this big transformative impact. And so it also serves as a call to collective action. Um, there's a really great article by Kania and Kramer um, that talks about collective impact. And um, it, it, it really is the idea that we don't need sort of another math association um, to, to work on things. And we don't even necessarily need a bunch of new initiatives by the current associations that exist. We sort of need to um, uh, pull in the same general direction, which we, we really already are, but leverage the work of the other associations and not see things as competitive, but see it as, um, you know, this synergy and, and working, more working together and, and that sort of thing. So um, we recognize that improving teaching and learning really requires these well-coordinated efforts, even in institutions with faculty and administrators, and then going beyond there to employers and professional associations and certainly funding agencies. So we all have to um, work on this together. So I want to clarify that we intentionally did not focus on developmental courses or K-12 education not because they aren't important and not because there aren't challenges, but because we only had two years and $300,000 to do it. And so we wanted to make sure that we proposed something that we thought we could actually accomplish in that period of time. Um, so we see that as phase two efforts. And I already, um, there are already some um, efforts that have begun um, in, in both regards. So um, I want to tell you about the common themes that we did identify, and these are articulated in the report. Um, a big common theme across all of those curricular guides that we read is the status quo is unacceptable. We really have to make some changes. Um, one of the recommendations is to have more statistics, modeling, simulation, and computation. That's part of that modernized curriculum. Those kinds of um, activities um, and skills are becoming more and more important um, in, in the workforce. And um, again, less traditional lecturing and more active learning techniques. And again, active learning, we're talking about anything that engages students, basically anything other than traditional lecture. There's a Freeman um, article um, that's referenced in the report um, that you can get that that is a meta-analysis of, I don't know, Shandy probably knows, a couple hundred um, studies or something, and overwhelmingly active learning techniques, there you get uh, higher success rates um, with um, teaching techniques that enga actively engage students. So um, another common theme is multiple pathways. And so I mentioned Uri Treisman earlier and the Carnegie Foundation Mathway uh, Statway, Quantway, and now the new Mathways project. Um, so those are concerned with um, general education math and stat requirements. Um, and so that's, that's an important common theme that all of the curricular guides talked about, but also into and through majors in the mathematical sciences. You know, perhaps there are other entry points, alternative entry points, um, or alternative pathways through majors um, that would better serve our students. And then the increasing role of two-year colleges, that was a common theme. Um, attention to student transitions and transfer between institutions, so that's from K-12 all the way through. Um, technology to enhance student learning, and so that's sort of not just technology for technology's sake, but technology that enhances student learning. Um, curricula de development efforts with partner disciplines um, is important and emphasizing students' um, communication skills, helping them develop their communication skills. And also, our faculty reward systems are incredibly outdated. Um, the tenure and promotion criteria, and so um, 
we aren't the first call for this. Um, I, I was involved with the Ingenious Project a few years ago, and there's quite a bit of um, uh, quite a bit of uh, language in there about how outdated our reward systems are and how they need to be updated. So that Ingenious uh, Project is referenced in the Common Vision Report. So you can find that if you're interested in it. And then also sustainability of initiatives. Um, so we sort of have, it seems as a community, sometimes we like REUs are a good example that I always talk about that are a great idea, but they have not, in, in general, they have not become sustainable. Um, institutions continue to ask, you know, the same institutions year after year ask the National Science Foundation for funding. And so um, we are looking for things that, um, you know, with some seed money, with some grant money, get some things started, and then the institutions can sort of, you know, they can institutionalize those and then sustain them on their own, and they don't require continued um, grant funding in order to um, keep them going and improve things. So there were some other important themes that we talk about in the Common Vision Report, and um, they were present in some but not all the guides, but we want to talk about them. We feel like they um, deserve considerable attention, and I think part of the reason that they were not present in all the guides is because some of the guides are a little older, and some of these are a little bit more recent. So we went ahead and, and um, talked about these quite a bit. So one of them is student diversity. Um, we have just not figured out how to attract and retain a diverse student population in the mathematical sciences, and it is a dreadful shortcoming that we have to figure out how to remedy. It's just um, dreadful is the best word I can think of. Um, way back in 1998, Stiff and Harvey, and this reference is in the report, called the math classroom one of the most segre segregated places in the country. But today, upper-level math classes still remain predominantly white. And I would even go so far as to say that um, calculus classes remain either predominantly white or I guess I could say white and perhaps Asian. Um, there are very little um, in the way of um, underrepresented minorities that are black and Hispanic. because, the, And the reason I say that is because with the calculus study I mentioned earlier, um, we looked at gender differences. Um, that's how we came up with that statistic about women are twice as likely as men to switch. But we didn't have enough underrepresented minorities in the calculus classes to even be able to look at um, race as um, or ethnicity as um, a, a factor. So um, it still isn't good. So the performance gap today is also it's as, it's. Er Sorry, it's evident as early as fourth grade. Um, so that's tragic. Um, and so it's our responsibility, our responsibility as faculty, as administrators, um, anybody involved in math education to remove barriers and to not approach this um, from the perspective of somehow women and minorities are less capable or less prepared. And I don't think any of us would I don't, well, I don't know, I shouldn't say that. I hope that we don't think women and minorities are less capable, but perhaps we think they're less well prepared or whatever it is, but somehow it's like there's something wrong with them um, and we need to sort of fix what's wrong with them instead of looking at our systems and the way we do things and, and considering, oh, we've placed barriers there for people and there's some things that we need to fix with our, our system and the way we do things. So um, another important theme is student mobility. Um, almost half of all students in four-year institutions have credit on their transcripts from two-year institutions. And I'm, I'm thinking probably you all from, from two-year schools are not surprised by that. I think people at four-year institutions are, are generally pretty surprised by that statistic and they don't realize how high that is. Um, and student mobi mobility seems to be most prevalent among low-income students, and so that's another challenge that they face. Um, and so we really do have a shared responsibility across all levels of education from pre-K through graduate level um, to, to help deal with, with, or help students with um, those challenges. So you all know contingent faculty is another important um, issue. Um, that's sort of um, growing. Um, so we defined contingent faculty to be any non-tenure track position. So keep in mind it's full-time, part-time, short-term, long-term, 
but any position that's not um, tenure track. So I know with community colleges, right, our, our issue is really adjuncts. Um, so that'd be the part-timers. And so we're depending on adjuncts more and more and more and more and more. 76% um, of appointments in higher ed are contingent positions. Now this is the, you know, the definition here that I'm using, full-time, part-time, short-term, long-term. Um, and up to two-thirds of appointments in two-year institutions are part-time positions. Um, so that seems to be getting um, bigger and bigger. So these folks need professional development and support, I think equally as much as full-time tenure-track faculty do. Um, but I know at my institution, we don't provide um, funding for adjuncts to attend conferences and things like that. We don't provide travel. We don't provide registration fees. We will pay them for their time if they come to campus. Um, and engage in professional development and we do require them to get eight hours a year and we do pay them for that but I know that that's not the norm at community colleges across the country I think a lot of places don't have any funding at all to provide um, and on our in our district um, we have about 70 full-time math faculty and we have like 200 um, sorry full-time math faculty and then we have about 200 adjuncts in math across the district so it's it's a huge issue for us and then we talked about also graduate teaching assistants and their issues are sort of uh, 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 similar to the contingent faculty and I'm not going to go into that um, in this webinar because I think the majority of this audience is probably community college faculty so um, other important themes included future teachers um, I think that our community doesn't understand uh, well enough that the specialized knowledge needed for teaching is distinct from the knowledge needed from other math intensive professions, but not less. It's just different. And so it's not somehow a lesser sort of a program, um, but we sort of sometimes I think we just lump them all in with all the other math majors and think that that's good. So um, this the Conference Board on the Mathematical Sciences. Um, put out a report in 2001 on the mathematical education of teachers and then they put out another report in 2012 sort of uh, an update to that and um, you can access that on on their website or maybe Shandy will maybe Shandy will put the link in there um, and then um, failure rates obviously is um, that's a big issue for for us I think probably for all of you um, we talk about in the report that the high rate of failure in post-secondary math classes is an embarrassment to our profession. We really should be embarrassed at how bad um, those rates are. And um, we all know, well, I, I think we all know math courses are the most significant barrier to degree completion in all fields. Um, and then developmental courses, you know, I said that we didn't focus on that, um, but we did um, talk a little bit about it. Um, we mentioned that about 60% of entering community college students have to take developmental courses. Um, and most students who are not allowed to take credit-bearing math course, they have to take developmental math courses when they come in, will never graduate. So um, other issues that I won't elaborate on here um, include calculus, um, technology-enabled delivery methods, assessment, and then scaling, and I sort of mentioned already sustainability. Um, I heard Uri Treisman say a few years ago that um, no one has ever successfully scaled up any uh, sort of successful initiative that started out. Um, and so I, I have been watching for something that I thought you know, I could point to and go, oh, look, they scaled that up, but I haven't found anything yet. So um, part of the issue with that, um, he, he uh, contends that part of the reason is we don't design our initiatives with scale in mind. We design them um, as sort of these small boutique programs, and it works great for 20 students or for 40 students. But if you tried to scale it to all, you know, we have 15,000 students on our campus. If we tried to scale it to all of them, we wouldn't have the manpower or whatever to be able to do it. So we have to think instead of ways to design our initiatives from the ground up so that they will be scalable if they prove to be. Um, effective and we and we decide we want to sort of um, scale them up across like our entire district or across our entire campus um, let's see 
So we have some recommendations for um, various stakeholders, and I'm only going to talk about the ones for the community at large during this webinar. Um, the other ones sort of reiterate some of the things I said previously. So um, <clears throat> the recommendations for the community is that we really need to update um, curricula. Um, we really need to scale up the use of evidence-based pedagogical methods, so those have, that have been shown to be effective um, with some level of evidence. Um, we need to articulate clear pathways between curricula at the K-12 level and then the first courses that students take in college. Um, and that doesn't mean, um, I mean, that's a partnership, right? That's not just us doing something. That's working with K-12 folks. Um, and we have to find ways to remove barriers facing students, um, all kinds of barriers, but um, in particular at critical transition points when they are um, coming in and placing into classes or when they're transferring to other institutions. Um, and we need to establish stronger connections with other disciplines. Um, and again, there are other <coughs> recommendations for specific um, stakeholders in the report. So <clears throat> I mentioned a call to action in the report. And um, I'll elaborate that on a little bit more. Um, so we need to ensure that students graduate with the skills that they need that, that prospective employers are looking for. And in order to do that, we're going to have to modernize our curricula. And we need input from partner disciplines, from business, industry, and government. Um, we're, really, we're really talking about sort of non-academic jobs, right? I mean, we know how to prepare students to be like a mini-me right, to be a faculty member, that's easy, um, and we do that well. Well, uh, we, we don't necessarily prepare them to teach very well sometimes, but um, we sort of, that's what we focus on, and so we don't focus, I think, as much on non-academic um, careers at the graduate level, for sure. Um, so anyway, we, we should get input from these folks on our curricula. Um, we need to create a coherent, intriguing introduction to college math for all students. Again, not just math and science majors. Um, and we really should work to narrow the gap between, you know, if you think about how a mathematician practices mathematics and how other employment sectors, applied mathematicians and, and, and engineers and physicists and people like that, um, the way they practice mathematics and you compare that to how students experience math in our math classes in higher ed, there's a, there's a huge gap between the way it really is practiced and the way we teach it and the way students experience it. And so we really advocate um, for the community to find a way to narrow that gap. Um, so the common vision, I mentioned the Ingenious Project earlier, um, and there was a really great call to action in that report, and so we actually quoted that in, in this report. And it has to do with changing a culture and changing practices and how difficult that is. Um, and so we, we get it. We know that it's hard just in departments, um, much less in institutions and organizations. Um, but we sort of um, called upon um, mathematicians to think about when we do research, we're always, we're always willing and we're eager to sort of, you know, that method didn't work so well or it didn't work at all, throw that out and find something that works better. I mean, we have to do that to be successful in research. And so it's, it's sort of that's reason for optimism to think that, okay, we can do that with our curriculum and our teaching and stuff, right? It's like this This obviously isn't working well in a lot of respects. And so we should sort of happily <laughs> abandon our unsuccessful strategies or some somewhat successful strategies for better ones, but um, it doesn't seem to come that easily to us. So um, we just see this as an opportunity to live up to our professional responsibilities by improving, and Ingenious talked about workforce preparation, and in Common Vision, we're talking about undergraduate math education across the board, um, especially in the first two years. So moving forward, um, I mentioned this whole phase two um, that we don't we don't have funding for it. It's not an official like you know NSF funded project or anything like that. But there are some things that are happening, um, and so we encouraged um, in the report. We encouraged, um, let's see, oh, wait, sorry. Oh, yeah, we encouraged people to continue to work together, um, and we kind of proposed a path forward for continued collaboration. Um, I mentioned um, 
the projects that or the proposals that the participants at the workshop wrote up um, that was part of this path forward for continuing this collaboration and so we think it's really critical to maintain this connection with all of the professional associations and the people that have been involved um, and to capitalize on that and move things forward and so I mentioned earlier that we don't see these things as competing efforts um, I know um, you know, we think of the American Math Society, they're sort of, they fo focus on graduate education and, and research mathematics and that sort of thing. And, you know, the American Statistical Association focuses on statistics and SIAM focuses on um, applied math and the MAA focuses on undergraduate math education and AMATIC focuses on the first two years and developmental math and all of that. And, and I think in years past, we've been sort of, I, I sort of felt this when I went to MAA that I needed to be really careful Oh, and I didn't mention NCTM. I forgot. They focus on K-12 math. Um, and so I think I felt like this need to sort of tiptoe and be really careful not to step on anybody's toes. And we don't want to kind of intrude on their territory. That's really what they do. And um, when I attended my um, uh, first AMATIC conference that I attended after I went to MAA, um, you all probably know Julie Phelps. And she was involved in... Um, sort of a developmental math summit that happened before the AMATIC conference. And she said, oh, no, 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 we don't see it that way at all. We, we see that we need to work together and, and we need the MAA to advocate about, you know, um, developmental courses and about gen ed courses and stuff like that. And so anyway, it was a really good um, experience for me um, to attend that summit. And that's what really got me started thinking about how um, it is much more powerful when we all collaborate and work together than if we sort of see ourselves as competing somehow. So um, a primary point, again, that was emphasized by all the guides is that the status quo is unacceptable. And this next comment actually came from that PCAST report that I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, um, that they said <clears throat> that it's incumbent on the math sciences community to make sure that we are at the center of these changes that are unquestionably coming. So it was sort of like, we shouldn't just be on the periphery and go, oh, okay, math, uh, physicists and engineers want to teach calculus. Okay, yeah, maybe they can do a better job of it. It's like, no, we need to be involved, and we also need to let them know about what we've been doing already. Part of that report um, was prompted, or part of the the reason the report was written the way it was was because they, they weren't aware um, of some of the things that the math community had done. And so, again, that's part of the reason for Common Vision. So, moving forward, um, the MAA has begun working on an instructional practices guide, um, which will actually be the first of its kind. Um, and it involves all five of the Common Vision associations that I mentioned earlier, including AMATIC. Um, and we even have Diane Breyers, who is the immediate past president of NCTM, um, she is on the advisory board um, for that um, project. And then AMATIC has begun its uh, latest update of its curricular recommendations. I mentioned Beyond Crossroads, and they've kind of jokingly said, is it going to be Beyond Beyond Crossroads? Um, and I'm actually serving on the writing team, and um, there's been some conversation there about the Common Vision Report kind of serving as a good foundation for that um, to, to build on. Um, and then Tipsy Math. Um, that stands for Transforming Post-Secondary Education in Mathematics, um, and Uri Treisman is part of that group, and um, they, they are focusing more on policy efforts, um, but they're also um, preparing for a conference in October where it's going to be kind of a chairs plus one meeting, and so they're looking to bring in people from um, institutions that are interested in engaging in some of these um, initiatives and um, they asked me to provide um, recommendations for community college faculty and chairs and so I sent I think I sent um, about I think they let us send six pairs um, that we recommended so those invitations will be going out pretty soon um, and then NCTM is also working to build out from common vision into the k-12 sector we have um, at MathFest this year coming up in August, we're going to bring together a group of um, K-12 folks um, as part of the, the very end of the Common Vision Project to talk about how to um, move it forward in the K-12 sector. Um, and then the MAA submitted a stat prep grant proposal in January, and it looks like it's going to be funded for a couple million dollars, and it's really 
Um, I do not use that word revolutionize lightly. It really aims to revolutionize the way we teach statistics. Um, and so I really hope that it gets funded. It's focused on, well, it's for faculty at all types of institutions, but it is focused on community colleges. And um, Kate Kozak is one of the co-PIs on that. And um, so um, that'll, be, that'll be really great um, because we'll be able to provide professional development for adjuncts as well. Um, and then the MAA also submitted a PMET 2 grant proposal um, that's focused on preparing secondary math teachers. We don't know if that's going to be funded or not, um, but it does focus on um, common core ideals. And so um, I'll wrap this up and then take questions that you all have. Um, there are two profound principles that are, that are reflected in these recent efforts um, that we think will help ensure our forward progress and success. Now, these are really profound, so I'm focused on that word. We must stop reinventing the wheel, and oops, and we especially must stop reinventing the flat tire. So um, thank you for hanging in there through the whole uh, presentation. And now, let's see, Julie, do you want to have people raise their hands or do you want to just have them type in any questions that they have? Yeah, they can type them in the question and answer box, then we can keep track of what's been answered. Okay. That, that would work. Yeah, and if, um, if, oops, I didn't need to do that. Oh, I was going to show you, um, so the, the first webinar that we did, there were a bunch of links that Shandy and other people put in, and so that's on this slide in the, the PowerPoint that Julie will post, and then there, there are references, the things that I referred to in this um, PowerPoint are here, but then a full list of references is there. Um, so there's my email address if you all um, want to email me about anything or if you want to request a copy of the report. So let's see. Uh, so I'm not seeing any questions come in. I'm not either. I saw one thing. Oops, I keep, I keep scrolling in the wrong window. <laughs> okay, let me get over here. Um, I saw somebody say something about Uri's comment that I thought looked good. I was going to go back. There was. That's in the chat someplace. Yeah, what did they say? They said... Uh, I'll check and see if anyone's hit the oh, raise their hand. Oh, go my, ahead. my two cents on Uri's statement, one alternative to scaling up is taking something that's already available at scale and turning it to be res and, and tuning it to be responsive to the needs across different sub-communities. That's a great point. Um, and and uh, Nancy said that a Maddox report will be out in January 2018, that sort of beyond beyond crossroads I mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, Let's see. Okay, it says the Common Vision Report is infused with attention to equity, diversity, and inclusion. Wondering about how you imagine next steps, how phase two might be explicit in attention to social justice as a particular way to disrupt the status quo. For example, incorporating ideas like um, excellence and equity in mathematics for all, a position statement on social justice in math that was put out by NCTM, TODOS, and NCSM. Um, so I... Oh, I can, yes, I can go back to the slides with, slide with the links that Shandy shared. Um, you know, one thing that's happening right now, and I don't, I don't think I have a very comprehensive answer to that question about um, how to disrupt the status quo, but I do think that um, Project Next is working very deliberately on that. Um, Dave Kung is the director of Project Next. Um, I guess we hired him about, uh, I guess it's been, he's done one full year as the director um, now. And so I guess it's been about a year and a half. And so he is very um, um, concerned and interested in um, sort of what Shandy mentioned there to kind of disrupt the status quo. And so he is bringing in um, speakers to Project Next and um, having them focus on those kinds of issues. We had... Um, Oh gosh, Shandy, help me. Um, Catherine uh, Good, is that her name? I think Catherine Good um, came and spoke to Project Next um, at MathFest last year. And she has a great, she's a social, social psychologist, I think, or sociologist. Anyway, she has um, great research that she's been working on for a long time about um, stereotype threat in the classroom. And um, I bet Shandy can put us up a link to some of that work or something. Um, because you really should, um, if you're interested in those kinds of issues, she's got great work too. And so we've had her come um, 
spoke to Project Next, and then we had her do a panel, ha had her do a session, just a general session at MathFest, and then she came to um, a conference that we just had um, in, as part of the calculus project I mentioned. We just had a conference in um, Minnesota um, a few weeks ago, and uh, Carolyn, uh, Catherine came and spoke there, and also Dave spoke, and they both spoke about diversity issues. So I think um, there needs to be more concerted um, sort of community-wide efforts, but I think it kind of has to start with these grassroots efforts, and then we, you know, we figure out a way to scale things up. Um, anyway, Shandy, do you have anything you want to add to that? And yeah, the presentation, Julie, you're going to post it. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, that'll be posted on the um, on the website with the video link. Okay. And but they won't be able to see the chat, right? Um, I can export it if we want to save the links again. Okay. I think I think most of the stuff she put in here we had before, but I didn't. Not the stuff about Catherine Good. Um, so perhaps okay. we could. Perhaps we could. Um, I don't know, maybe we could just put the links on another slide in the presentation, in the PowerPoint or something. Sure, before we upload it, absolutely. Yeah, okay. So yeah, I, I can do that and I can send you a newer version of it. That's okay, I can I can uh, download the chat and I can add it to the okay. to the PowerPoint. That's okay. a great, great way to disseminate that information. Okay, good deal. Yeah, thank you, Nancy, and um, yeah, thanks, Nancy. <laughs> Anybody else have comments or questions? Oops, did it again. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't so, see anything else. I don't see anything else coming in either, but don't sign off yet because I'm not done with you guys <laughs> today. <laughs> so, um, we definitely will share um, all Linda's materials uh, with you. And um, if we could just take a few moments in the chat window to uh, thank her and uh, to thank Shandy. Everyone who gives a presentation, a webinar, needs a Shandy. And, uh, <laughs> it made my job so much easier that I didn't have to try to guess what link was what. Um, I yeah. really, really appreciate it. So yeah. Linda, I'm going to um, share my screen and stop the share with yours. Okay. Oh, so I that I can that. go back to. Um, oops, that I can go back to uh, where. I, oh, I didn't leave. Didn't save my spot. So. Oh hi, hi Jane. Thanks. There we go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay. So um, just a few things uh, for us today to wrap up. I want to thank you um, for participating in today's webinar, um, especially again, a holiday weekend. That was awesome that we got so many people here and, and interacting. Um, if you're not a member of AMATIC, uh, please check us out. If you do uh, go to uh, bit.ly uh, slash join AMATIC, you can find some more information. Uh, we are on Facebook, um, so check us out on there. We do uh, post some things on there. Uh, the AMATIC webinars, so all these webinars that we've had and recorded, um, you can access them with this bit.ly slash AMATIC dash webinars, and, and all that stuff is going to be there. So we put the um, PowerPoints up with the presenter's uh, permission. So this one will be up there because Linda said we could share it. And then uh, we'll put the recording from today um, up there as well. So um, if you please would take two minutes to um, evaluate the webinar content and the presenter, I'm going to go ahead and put this in the, um, in the chat window. It's uh, bit.ly slash amatic49. That'll take you right to uh, the survey for today. And I see there's more stuff going on in the chat, all, all the thank yous, and I appreciate that. So um, bit.ly and then it's the slash, and it's the slash that has the positive slope. I can say that to this group. <laughs> <laughs> so if you um, would go to that survey, that would be great. And I don't know, it didn't show up as a hyperlink, but um, if you could just copy that and paste that into a browser, that should uh, take you there as well. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. If there's anything left um, for question-wise, uh, we can take care of that as well. Thanks for joining us today.